Hello everyone and welcome to Blue Table Talks. My name is Sherry Hubert. I'm the Associate Dean of Admissions at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. Welcome to our third installation of Blue Table Talks. For those of you who have joined us in the past, we're so excited um, to have this series to really showcase our students, our staff, our community in general, and the support that we provide to our students as they're going through their journey here at Fuqua. Um, Blue Table Talks is about real talks and so uh, get ready for a really engaging discussion. Today's session is focused on mental health well-being and mental health in general. You know, mental health well-being is something that we should all be prioritizing throughout our entire lives, but especially as individuals, students, and, and professionals who are going through rigorous, high-stressful master's degree programs. And so at Fuqua, we really want to make sure that our students feel as though they are supported, they are confident, they have um, the tools and the resources to really uh, be able to go through their program in a way that they can thrive and feel as though they're really thriving, despite some of the challenges that might be ahead of them or, or that they, may, they might encounter. And so, you know, focusing on mental health is, is extremely important. Having the dialogue, having dispelling the myths, um, dispelling the, the stigma. And so this is what this session's about. It's about talking to members of our student and administrative community about their own mental health journey. And then also, you know, what resources does Duke University overall, as well as the Fuqua School of Business, provide to support our entire Duke community in ensuring that we have mental health well-being. And with that, I am joined by wonderful panelists here. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, and then we're going to get right into the conversation. So with that, I'm going to ask Anna, do you want to introduce yourself yes, of first? Of course. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Callahan. I am in the first year program, the MMS program. I'm a student athlete here at Duke. I did my four year undergrad here at Duke as well. And I'm the co-founder of the ambassador program of a non-for-profit called Morgan's Message. I'm Stephanie Robertson, the Assistant Dean of Community Engagement and Inclusion here at Fuqua. I also went to Duke undergrad, so it's been great to be here supporting students. Hey everybody, my name is Ian Howard. I am a first year MBA student here at Fuqua. I did not go to Duke undergrad. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, happy to be here, happy to share my story. Uh, I'm going to second that because I did not go to Duke undergrad <laughs> either. Uh, but hello everyone, I am Ty Strong Luador. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist um, here at CAPS. I am also the assistant director of communication and outreach. And so you'll get to see me around campus trying to spread all the news about Duke's wonderful mental health resource, the Counseling and Psychological Services um, Center. Wonderful, that's a great place to start then. Um, language is so important in this sure. discussion, right? Mm -hmm. And approaching this with humanity. And so can you share, Ty, what are the appropriate uh, ways to, to talk about mental health, uh, you know, illness, challenges, disorders, I mean, what, what is correct, what is appropriate, what is human-centered um, as we embark okay. on this conversation? See, I like that one, the human-centered piece, um, because scientists will say the words that we use, mental illness or um, disorder, are, are the words that we should be using um, to discuss these challenges. I take it, I use the last language from a strengths-based perspective. Um, and so when my students come in, I often talk about mental health challenges. Um, mm -hmm. We really don't speak in disorders. We talk about just the disruption of life. Um, and I will tell students, like, so students come in and they say, oh, I'm anxious, I'm depressed. No, 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 no. <laughs> you're, and you're in. Like, right, we, like, that's who you are. You're just mm -hmm. experiencing these different things. Yeah. And so these things mm -hmm. tend to live with us. They're like, you know, a little cold you can't quite get rid of. It's a part of you and you learn how to cope with it and we learn how to work, uh, but it doesn't have to be seen as the end all for your life. So right. I like to talk about it in, from that framework for mental health. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Like, it's not you who you mm -hmm. are, it's just what you're experiencing. Okay, okay wonderful. Um, and this is for any of, the, uh, any of you. Um, have you ever experienced feelings of imposter syndrome, either in the work environment or as a student? You know, what are the ways in which you combat those? How does it manifest itself? Does anyone want to share their story? Yeah, I mean, as an athlete and growing up my whole life as an athlete, I feel like oftentimes we get these stigmas, like athletes aren't as smart as the regular student population at Duke. 
And I just kind of remember hearing either classmates or maybe sometimes professors just kind of insinuating that towards me. And it really made me kind of feel um, small and put in a box um, when I'm more than an athlete. You know, I'm a friend, I'm an ally, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter. All those things I feel as if should define me over um, my athletic performance or who I am as an athlete. I definitely, you know, love being an athlete and see a lot of great value in doing that. But a lot of times as, at Duke as an undergrad, you know, you're, you kind of hear these mutterings of like, oh, like she's an athlete. And it really, you know, you can really feed on that and it can really uh, take a toll on your confidence as a, as a person. And I just think some ways that I, I would combat that is just reminding myself uh, my value outside of my athletic performance and, you know, reminding myself that I, I did get into Duke. I'm smart enough to be here. I'm valuable. And just those affirmations really, really help me. And I know um, being there to support my friends and my teammates who also feel this way is, is important for me and uh, my confidence as well, just knowing that I can be there for those people. Anyone else want to share? Yeah, I think I, I guess my, my only follow on is that I felt a little bit of that um, at my previous company. And I think what I came to recognize very quickly is that it was a function of time. Like an imposter is just somebody who happened to get there a little bit later and then thinks they should have every bit of knowledge that the person who got there before them mm -hmm. currently has. Interesting, yeah, I like that. And like I suffered from that all the time. Not suffered, but I chewed on that a lot. I would ruminate on the fact that someone else who'd been there 15 years knew more than me. And then you have to step mm -hmm. back and kind of pull out of that and go, well, they should absolutely know more than you. Um, mm -hmm. And so I kind of, the way that I would rectify that and like sort it out in my head was it was just a function of time. And you're not an imposter, you're just somebody who got there later than somebody else. Mm -hmm. I like that. that. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That repositioning like yeah. your mind. Yeah. Um, in the work environment, anything that, that pops up? Um, this, this current job. <laughs> so, <laughs> actually, so um, diverse, I do diversity, equity, inclusion work, and it's a very unique space in that it is everything. I, a student told me, it was a great way to put it, it's everything and nothing. It just kind of depends on what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first got here, it's just, it was just kind of thing. There's Stephanie. Yay. Um, but then in 2020, after the murder of George Floyd, everyone came together like, oh, here's, we have someone. This is good that we had this person before this happened. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, but during the last maybe year, I definitely felt imposter syndrome because I'm not sure what my space is here right now. Um, you know, the, the um, energy has waned a bit. I mean, there are people who are still really dedicated to uh, racial equity, but just in general, like what is now, what is the role now that I'm supposed to be pursuing and how do I best support the students? And it's, it's been a bit of a struggle, but I think that um, having great students work with me has been uh, very pivotal in me getting better. Still there, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, but, but getting better, so. Um, are there signs, you know, when you see either you know, classmates or students, uh, are there signs or symptoms that you can tell when someone is struggling a little bit? And if so, what are those? What should either we ourselves, you know, who might be going through something on any moment by moment, um, look out for, mm -hmm. or in our loved ones? Um, any, anyone want to chime in? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. I think um, for me and what I've realized is when people like self-isolate, um, when people self-isolate or um, the language that they'll use talking about themselves, I think is something that is really important to key in on. Um, I often try to handle it in a way that if I hear somebody, for instance, like talking about food, um, being like, oh, I just ate that, like I got to go run, you know, two miles to go make up for that. I often, you know, not in a public setting, but kind of will pull that person aside at a, at a later time and just be like, hey, you know, I heard that you mentioned this. Can I be here for you? Is there anything that, you know, I can do to help you? And that's normally received pretty well, but I typically look at um, self-isolation, um, the way that they describe themselves or maybe their current situation. And then also just like body language is a big one too. Like um, when people, especially like, you know, for our team, we see people coming into the locker room every morning and there's a difference between like looking tired and like looking like you're, you know, going through something. So finding ways to best approach that I think has been um, definitely a learning curve for me, but I've enjoyed that process of learning. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, I'm gonna, you know, ask you two, you know, Anna and Ian, can kind of take us back, um, talk to us a little bit about why did you decide to pursue your master's business degrees, right? Anna, you in the MMS, mm -hmm. master's management studies program, and you're your MBA. 
Uh, Ian, do you want to start sure. first? What, yeah. what made you decide? Um, so I think the the easy answer is that I knew for a while um, that I wanted to do it. It was something that I had in my head for a long time. And I don't actually know why. I think it was probably like association with something better than what I was doing currently. But um, the, the way that I actually got to I'm going to apply was I started feeling myself stagnate in my my previous role. What uh, were you doing? Yeah, so for the five years before I was at uh, Duke, do my MBA, I was at Netflix in a content mm -hmm. media operations role, which mm -hmm. was amazing, a wonderful experience, like truly the best, like best mm -hmm. job. Um, and I experienced a ton of growth and was like very, very lucky to be there. And then at the end, I felt myself plateauing in terms of one, my ability to contribute just based on structural stuff, and then two, uh, an inability to grow any further based on structural stuff. There was just no, it was a ceiling. And it wasn't anything other than just the organization was really lean. Um, and so I started picking around it. Could I move within the organization? Could I pivot to a different company doing the same thing? Do I want to do that? And what I felt more than anything was I don't want to be pigeonholed. Like, I just got really scared of being pigeonholed. Um, and so the decision for me to come to Fuqua was, what is gonna give me an opportunity to like broaden my aperture as much as possible mm -hmm. at this stage of my life so that in the future, pigeonholing is a risk that I've, a risk that I've mitigated. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that was kind of the decision for me, and then I'm sure we could talk about this later, but Fuqua specifically held its own special yeah. place that I decided on. Yeah. yeah. And then I actually have a question for you, which I think this is really interesting we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like your goals after you graduated, like from undergrad, coming into this new program, even starting your new job, did that change a lot like from your current goals now? You know, maybe that's a product of environment, maybe that's just mindset yeah, change. For yeah. sure. Um, I think when I graduated from undergrad and was in the working world for the first time, I was like very concerned with safety. Mm -hmm. Like very concerned yeah. with setting myself up to be yeah. occluded from any like uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to like mitigate that. Put a bunch of walls up me like I, whatever comes, I'm good. Mm -hmm. And now I think which I'm really grateful for, I'm I'm looking at the world less of a less through a lens of like things I have to mitigate and things I can tap into. Mm -hmm. And so um, both in the way that I'm thinking about being here in the classes I'm taking and what I'm recruiting for and where I'm recruiting, all those are through a lens of like, I want to learn more, I want to be in more uncertain mm -hmm. situations, I want to stretch, I want to be uncomfortable. And I think Fuqua has been really instrumental in facilitating an environment that, that Foments that. Right. Oh, that's right. Awesome. It's so, so interesting you use pigeonhole because that's the term I used when I was <laughs> thinking about business school too. I wanted mm -hmm. to chart my own course, didn't want to get pigeonholed. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna, what about you? you? You're an athlete, you're yes. a student, you're mm -hmm. a professional, you're president of a, you know organization, yes, you've yeah. done so many things. Why the Master's of Management Studies program and what do yeah. you want to do? So I think when I was thinking about originally applying here um, to th this program, what really drew me in was um, the focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion that this program actually had. I just remember kind of reading you know, up on some things online and then hearing from some of my former teammates about what they really enjoyed about um, Fuqua as a whole, but more specifically the MMS program, was how much they learned about other people, mm -hmm. but also about how much that force them to grow. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I love to put myself into uh, situations that I grow. I'm in the constant pursuit of growth. And this was the perfect program to do that. On top of that, I had an extra year of eligibility for athletics. Um, and it was just a no brainer to take it here at Duke. Um, I love my coaches. I adore my teammates. My parents are so supportive and just love the professors at Duke, just the environment that Duke creates. And um, I think when anyone hears Duke, they just like hear of this like crazy close knit environment. And um, I just, I love that about um, here, but it's been a really cool journey and to meet amazing people like you all and to meet some of these, uh, some of my classmates and the group focus that it is, it just is, is such a special experience. And, yeah, I I want to jump on that really mm -hmm. quickly because yeah. we can take a quick detour. But like the you earlier, I think you mentioned human centered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was something about Fuqua that landed or that like 
knocked that vein for me as well. Yeah. Like it, I spoke to a few different programs and it was like so clear that Fuqua like knew who I was when I wasn't a student. They like cared about my application. They like Ooh. checked in on me. And like those are not things that happen. Just yeah. FYI. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't yeah. mention that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not, uh, not, not, uh, yeah, not, yeah, not a plug, yeah. but yeah. yeah. I just thought that was interesting that you had that experience too across the programs because mm-hmm. I know the MBA is its own yeah. little yes. microcosm. Yeah, and I have um, a couple other friends that are also in the um, MQM program, and one of them actually was a former student athlete here, and kind of hearing about her switch from you know student athlete life to just being um, a regular student is very interesting actually, and um, a lot of the times in athletics you have all these different um, checkpoints checking in on you and making sure that you're you know succeeding and feeling good and um, having this great environment and. She, I feel like, I don't want to entirely speak for her, but from watching her experience, she's been able to make all these great friends and have a a good experience at MQM and have an environment where she feels like she has, you know, different checkpoints and all these resources, like the Career Center, the DEIB Center, all the different workshops we've done. It's just so, they want you to succeed so bad here at Duke and, you know, are just equipping you with those resources to do so. And I think that's very special. Right. Yeah. I mean, so true. Um, in addition to the you know academic co-curricular support, I mean, it's, again, it's also the support um, to make sure that your whole self is is doing fine. Totally. Too, right. And the application process, as you guys know, can be daunting, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And you know, with the best of intentions, but it still can be a little daunting and challenging. Mm-hmm. And you know, sometimes it invoke a little bit of imposter syndrome. And we are, I feel like our team does so much to go above and beyond to make sure that people feel comfortable throughout the entire process. So um, was there anything throughout that application process that really helped you either um, that either resonated with you or was a little bit more stressful? How did you handle it? Did anything kind of trigger anything um, for you during, throughout that process? Um, I guess I'll, I'll tackle that in a few ways. The, the f- yeah, so the mm-hmm. process is daunting because it's, it's daunting. Mm-hmm. Um, you are, like, self-selecting into a pool of very competitive people that all want something that there's, like, a limited amount of spots for. Mm-hmm. And so just the nature of it, like, is kind of brutal. Um, I recall not feeling stressed until I started talking to people. It's very mm-hmm. easy to put blinders on. And then as soon as you go on the Internet... Mm-hmm. you can, like, go down a rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, I think what was the first kind of catalyst for stress for me was, like, seeing everybody posting scores and, you know, oh. being very candid, if I, I'll use candid, um, <laughs> on, like, forums. And I quickly stopped going on yeah, those forums. I, I think what Fuqua did to ameliorate those feelings was kind of run their own race in terms of the application like the 25 random things essay is like Mm -hmm. the like that'll what that told me was that we as an institution care about the person versus Mm -hmm. like so like you still got to submit all your stuff you're Mm -hmm. you're going to be evaluated on your aptitude but you're also being looked at as a as somebody with a soul and like you're being evaluated on your personhood. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very interesting. And that took the tension for me, the internal tension, way down. Because Mm -hmm. I know, to your point earlier, I have a lot to offer in my personhood. And I have a lot to offer on paper, but if I can show you who I am as a person, Mm -hmm. that, I start wiping away all the the self-doubt. Yeah, that's so true. So if you had some advice to give to other applicants out there, because we have you know, people in various stages um, listening in, um, you know, in terms of, you know, describe ways in which applicants can care for themselves throughout this process. What Mm -hmm. would you say? What advice would you give them? Yeah, I (laughs) do this a lot. It's called the floating rock theory, um, where I say, like, at the end of the day, we all just live on a floating rock. We're tiny people on a floating rock amongst, like, 8 billion people. (laughs) Like, I am going to be okay, and if it's not okay right now, it's not the end. That's kind of what I always tell myself. In the end, it's always gonna be okay. Whatever your path is, whether you're coming to Duke, whether you go to a different school, and 
you know, whatever your path is, you're going to be successful and that's the path you're set out to be on. And I think especially, you know, through this process, I'll bring up those 25 facts yeah. again. Yeah. Just like remind yourself, like you're amazing. Like all those facts are what makes you, you. And I remember putting those down and like being so stressed about it. Like I was like, why am I stressed about these things about me? And I think that again, ultimately took the stress off of me. Um, is just reminding myself like the things that make me, me is what's going to differentiate me from the other candidates and other applicants. And um, especially like being a Duke undergrad, uh, I was a little bit worried that that was gonna like take away from, cause you know, Fuqua really loves to like diversify its candidates, take people from different schools or different professions. And I was like, I'm worried that they're not gonna just wanna have this Duke to Duke pipeline. And at the end of the day, what they chose wasn't just because I went to Duke or I didn't go to Duke. It's what I brought those intangibles that other people maybe didn't have. Yeah. So just reminding yourself that is like extremely important. Where did you learn that? Was that just something? You the floating said? rock yeah. theory. Um, I've actually learned that. I learned that from my uh, therapist, Dr. Sean Zeppelin, who works here um, at Duke. And he was like, you just need to remind yourself that like you literally are on a floating rock, like hurtling through space. Like it's all gonna be okay. Like, just take a deep breath. And for me, that helps. For some people, it may not, but like, I know that like often helps me with like overthinking yeah. and just being like, oh my gosh, like, yeah. that's such a small thing in the big screen of life, that's true. you know? That's right. That's yeah. Right. Um, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna I'll end up asking you each about your self care practices, but let me turn quick, you know, so Stephanie, um, you've been so open about your own mental health journey. Can you tell, uh, us a little bit more about your story, why you feel it's so important, mm -hmm. especially um, having a voice not only for yourself but also for students in our program and for staff. You're such an advocate for staff as well and in the higher education space being able to, to talk about mental health. So I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, uh, bipolar 2, um, maybe about eight years ago and I had um, some type of mental health um, condition disorder since I was like 27 and actually first manifested when I was in law school. Uh, so when I see students recruiting here, it's just like, oh, I, I want to go hug them and just like shield them because that was what, uh, I now look back, I went through um, a manic phase, a hypomanic phase and then depression where I couldn't get up out of bed. And um, I did very poorly that semester and you know, there was on top of imposter syndrome already. You know, I didn't I was like, why am I here in law school? Why did I do this? Um, and I think I, I talk about that because that was one of the first times I, I recognized that I had a mental health um, condition. Um, I call it mental health illness when I'm not doing, or mental illness when I'm not doing well. So it's like, it's interesting the language piece, me personally. I never say it, I never use it for anybody else. But um, at that point, it felt like a mental, mental illness. And so, uh, but now when I work with students, I'm just, I, I want to make sure that they're okay because I see them going through very similar, I, I know that they don't all have mental health conditions, but there are, you know, a number of students who have come up to me and that's, why I tell my story. Um, the first song, like maybe it was like four weeks in, y'all are here. Mm -hmm. um, and we do a workshop together, and I tell everybody in a very nuanced way <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> that I have bipolar too. Um, but it's, in, it's part of the, the identity exercise that we do. Mm -hmm. And I realized when I first started here that that's important because I want students to be their authentic selves. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not my authentic self, then why do I expect that from anybody else? So it's twofold. I want people to be their authentic selves and to let them know it's okay. And two, to let them know that you can come to me because I'm going to hold you. Make sure you're okay. We'll take a hug. We'll take a hug. But it, it's the breaking the stigma piece. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I also see that not many senior leaders or, or faculty members really speak openly about this. Um, and you'll read you know, articles about CEOs and other people breaking their own silence because they understand that they need to lead um, by example. And hoping that I can also help uh, my peers and colleagues do that as well because it really does help the students. And students, yeah. um, I mean, they go to two people now, it seems like, <laughs> whenever they're like, you know, Jeremy Petrenka is amazing. Um, and I like really open about our, our, yeah. our mental health. Yeah. and. Like we need more people to be more open about it. But staff as well, I feel that, especially this last couple of years with staff, um, the, the, we, we weren't as close, of course, because we couldn't be physically close. It's like, well, how do we maintain that closeness? Um, and we did a decent job, but it was still virtual. And I think coming back, 
but that, that we're all trying to figure out what it even looks like anymore. So it's like, I want to be able to support our staff in this process as well, because I know our staff are startling too. Yeah. Um, and in order for us to support you all, we need to make sure our staff yeah. are doing good. So yeah. But yeah, my story is because I want to be able to, to have people know that it's okay to talk about it. Mm -hmm. and, and, I'm successful. Yeah. I, well, I, you're also successful. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. So it's like yes, yeah. I mean, I, I would love to share this with, you know, everyone listening and, and people at this table, but I will never forget like the workshop that we did about vulnerability and identity. And it was the entire um, MMS Section C um, group, I believe. And we all sat at tables with our new assigned groups. And, you know, you walked around and you were saying, these are my things that I identify with and these are the things that I want to share with you guys and um, with you all and I just challenge you all to be very vulnerable and with this group and that really resonated with me and I know how much it resonated with a lot of my classmates and I just remember leaving there feeling very like safe knowing that I had someone to go to if I um, needed a place to go and I just think that again is the differentiator between Duke and any other place is we have people like you who are willing to share those things and be open and it changes lives and I know sometimes the mundane day in and day out it can be hard to remember that but just know that that really left a big impact on me and I know a lot of the students here at Fuqua so thank you for sharing that and doing all of that. Yes and I would say you know I'm, I'm curious what do you feel like what advice would you share in terms of ways in which um, we can be more respectful as coworkers, students, classmates, um, you know, of people's mental health journey, what tools are, are available or we should we be thinking about seeking out? Because I know for me, I found the mental health first aider training yep. to be extremely valuable as a friend of someone whose you know, best friends are struggling with this and with their children as a manager and a leader in terms of the professional environment. I mean, so what are the tools that we, you know, those of us out there yep. could avail ourselves of? So with my position, I try to create or help students create safe spaces to be able to have conversations. And it really is like, let's just create a space to talk about mental health. It's almost, it's giving people permission to do that. And suddenly people are very open. But if you don't have that space created, it's very interesting. <laughs> to see that people are still very closed about this. It's like, first off, creating spaces, but also the example piece is still very, very important, being the example. Creating spaces, also bringing in or training experts or people to be experts in um, showing others how to do it. Yeah. Uh, so Mental Health First Aid is a program that we are really proud of that we, we do here. We have several instructors. Uh, we try to do a training for um, students and staff once a semester, a, a term. And um, it, it's a great training, but what it really does is help you feel comfortable with talking to people. Mm -hmm. I think that the biggest issue, the biggest issue in my mind is the stigma attached to this. Um, I actually, you can ask me about having bipolar too all the time. You know, it's like, but yeah. people won't do they can, even though I say it out loud. Mm -hmm. so, but the training I think yeah. does a good job of, of saying, no, actually, it's not even about you know asking someone, you know, what this is about is checking in on them when you know that they're not doing well. Yeah. People are still just really afraid yeah. to do that. Okay. Um, so just the space to, to, to be yourselves, but also to talk and to yeah. know that it, you should be able to and feel comfortable to talk, especially here at Fuqua. Yeah. Yes. So Ty, uh, you shared with us your role. You have you wear lots of hats. I wear lots of um, hats. May, could you ex could you share again just with us? You know what is Caps? Okay. What is your role? How does the university as an umbrella support um, you know, the community uh, with it when it comes to mental health? Um, so again, I am the, uh, so I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, uh, which yes, I do marry couples and families, but I work with individuals. Uh, we just focus systemically. Actually, my research is in emerging adulthood, so that's why I love mm -hmm. mental health in a college population. Uh, yeah. Because as you all are talking about this, like this is onset stage. This is when we really need to start having some conversations mm -hmm. um, and examining behaviors. I, I love it. Um, <laughs> and so marriage and family therapist, um, but also the assistant director of communication outreach. That role is still being developed, uh, but what it has looked like so far is getting 
to know faculty and staff on campus and also hearing what students want mm -hmm. from CAPS. Mm -hmm. Okay, so counseling and psychological services. If you do not know where we are, Student Wellness Building, third floor. Um, <laughs> and if you, if you need to GPS it, 305 Tower View Drive. Mm -hmm. But um, we work with all students. So we're, we're here as a resource for all students. I know I've heard, you know, is it just undergraduates who can come? I did sit at a table here in Fuqua, mm -hmm. and grad students did not mm -hmm. even know that. It's like, y'all, no, you are here. Come, just come, <laughs> come see us, come see us. And um, so, as a university, what we can offer as a resource for our students here, uh, our services. So we do group counseling. There are individual counseling services. There are workshops. Uh, starting next year, uh, you saw us at a few tables this year, but starting next year, there'll be more tables because the goal is prevention. And so what can we get out here and get to meet students and put things in their hands to start teaching skills along the way uh, before it becomes one of those yellow or red crisis area situations. And now you're like, oh, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do, what to do. And we are here for that as well. Um, but and we, we want to be a resource that helps students before things get bad. We can catch you when they do, but we, we want to help empower, um, encourage, and educate students on what to do before things get bad. What are some triggers that you see in students or what are situations that students find themselves that where they're feeling overwhelmed? Um, you know, as you all were talking about that imposter syndrome piece, <laughs> it is real. And I, I thought about it even from my standpoint and how it helped me understand students. Mm -hmm. When I came in, I, I said, effortless perfection is not real. And my goal is to dismantle that entire myth. But you feel it in the atmosphere. You feel it when you are, you're working with peers who are at your level or even above. And you're just trying to, to perform the way that you know you can, you're trying to achieve. And I see that working here, but also in being a student, what is it like now to be in this atmosphere for classes to seem a bit more difficult than they were for you? And then on top of your classes, there's that big push, okay, this is that tight-knit uh, setting, which is great, 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 great. But I've noticed this in my freshmen, when they come in, that uh, FOMO. Mm -hmm. So I have to join all the organizations. Yeah. I need to join this club, and I have to be in this club, and I have to do that too. That's not just yeah. at the under. <laughs> yes. I know. It's the opposite of I haven't joined anything. <laughs> like, I'm not engaging in this. <laughs> That's For that reason, this, and, and I'm out. Yeah. It gets to be very stressful, yeah. and it's great. Like you, you know, there's of course, be a well-rounded student, enjoy all of this, but. Take some time to realize that you are getting adjusted. This is a transition phase, and not only are you at a different level of education, um, mm -hmm. but you're now navigating what it is to be an adult. Like, mm -hmm. And that comes with its own sets of stressors, knowing what it is to, how to handle money. Oh, on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Same. Like, oh, no. yeah, you said, earlier you said emerging adulthood. Emerging adulthood. I've been in emerging adulthood for like far too long. I know. And handling money and like being, well, well, I guess to not joke about it, the, being in a new situation is like incredibly turbulent and everybody forgets about it. But as soon as you enter yourself in like, uh, whether it's school, yeah, let's use school. So a new school, new city, new friends, mm -hmm. unfamiliar, whatever, food, water, air, mm -hmm. new place you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. All of it all of it compounds on itself. Yes, it does. Very, very quickly. Yes, it does. And you move through the system fast mm -hmm. and you forget to check in, but it's... It's a transition. It's yeah, an adjustment. Yeah, it's a huge transition. Yeah. It's an adjustment. And you, you have to honor that, but, you know, we... I, well, I, I heard the speech. I don't know if you all heard the speech when you all were going off to college, but this is the best time of your life. You're going to enjoy mm -hmm. this. College is going to be great. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now say that to me when it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, my studying has to look differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. My laundry hasn't been washed. Like it's, yeah. The world is just about to end. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's, those are the, the types of triggers I see. It's, it's the adjustment and students being afraid to kind of honor themselves to be able to say, you know what, it's okay that this is difficult for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I am going to be okay, but this is just a small piece in this and I have to just work through it. Yeah. Um, so those, that's one of the, the main things. And then of course, you know, 
procrastination. Yeah. It's, yeah. The, it's the greatest one. Yeah, and yeah. it's even more challenging. We just had our Blue Table Talk before this was on um, first generation experience, oh. college experience. And so it's, you know, it even is even more difficult when uh -huh. it's just not something that you're familiar with or that the folks in your family were, that you have additional things you have to contend with, right, you're in this yes. new environment. Um, well, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Anna and Ian you know, to share with us a little bit more about the things that brought you here, made you, uh, made it important to you to be a part of this, right? So Ian, I'm gonna start with you and ask you, I um, mean, your previous work experience, I know you were involved with being a part of a mental health um, employee resource group. Can you talk a little bit about that group? How was it founded? What are the things that you focus on? Why was it important for you to be a part of that? Yeah, um, so, at Netflix, I was part of the mental health employee resource group. Um, I'm not sure when it was started um, or by who, but my involvement was it. My involvement in it, involvement in it, was essentially that I was a, a, a support for my team. Mm -hmm. I basically just like wore the moniker of I'm in this ERG and talk to me if you want to talk to me. Um, and uh, I was very surprised at how much that moniker mattered. Like, basically just associating yourself with that little group. I have zero qualification to talk to anybody about anything. But, but being part of that group opened the door, like the proverbial door for people to come and talk to me mm -hmm. and feel like I was a, a safe person to talk to. And so I was part of that for like three or four years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it greatly impacted n not only everybody else's ability around me to come and speak to me, but my ability to relate to my coworkers from similar backgrounds, different backgrounds, different offices. I remember interacting with some of my coworkers in Amsterdam and um, our, our Asian offices, like it, it opened the door. Um, the impetus for my joining that was that, again, going back to this imposter syndrome thing that we spoke about, it was just a really fast paced, really intense environment. And I needed to feel like people were on my team at work. Mm -hmm. And that felt like a place I could do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, when, when you say on your team, you mean like, like had your best interest at heart, exactly. Not for you, had yeah. your back. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So essentially, that was why I wanted to do that. Why it was important to me, and it, it paid dividends, you know, year over year over year. Um, and now I'm not part of anything similar to that. But I think what that did was allow me to feel a lot more comfortable in my personal life and in my professional life, I guess. Mm -hmm being that person, moniker or not. Mm -hmm. So now I can, you know, I feel very comfortable speaking to my group of friends going, hey, like, I just need, I need you to know that whatever it is that you're wrestling with, pull me aside, I'll buy you a cup of coffee, mm -hmm. forever, like, all good. Um, and I don't think that would have happened had it not been for that, for that group. Mm -hmm. How have you, in your in the program here, in the MBA program, how have you been able to continue to serve as a resource or support or you know any advice or anything that you would want to share in terms of your experience in the MBA program and how it has helped having that experience? I think it's all been fairly colloquial up to mm -hmm. this point. Nothing systemic or structured. Um, but I feel like within my circle and um, specifically within like my recruiting circle because you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier recruiting is a place where everybody starts to feel it mm -hmm. specifically within my little recruiting circle we're all doing the same thing um, all of us are on the edge of insanity at any <laughs> at all times <laughs> and so leaning on each other and being like hey literally we were talking about earlier just being able to text a group of guys and going like hey we're all good okay. yes or no okay it changes the whole mm -hmm. dynamic so mm -hmm. I haven't done anything structurally but individually I think at least the tenor of my interpersonal involvement now is much different than it would have been in my undergrad previous to mm -hmm. when I was involved in, in that group. Yeah, and um, I want this last question. Um, I'm curious, you said that you were very conscious and intentional about not getting involved in mm -hmm. things. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. And how did that, you know, like I think that's really important because, uh, well, you know, for people to understand why was that the decision you made for yourself that was important for you, the right decision for yourself? So, the, yeah, the reason that I decided to do that was because after years of not, I f I'm finally comfortable knowing my limits, I think. 
Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're all just like nice. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just a very supremely like average person, and when you ask me to do too many things at a high level, it's gonna start to suffer. And so I realized I'm, I wasn't. You know, I, I want to still work out. I still want to talk to my family. I want to make friends. I'd like to come out of here with a job that I wanted. I'd like to get good grades. I'd like to learn. That doesn't leave a lot of room for me to involve to be involved in a lot of things that are also going to be very time intensive on a like on a habitual mm-hmm. basis. And so for me, the decision was let's start really slow. You can always dip your toes in, but let's prioritize health, um, your professional options, and school and friends. And then everything else. Once we solidify those, mm-hmm. we being me and me. Um, then we can deal with it in spring. Let's talk about new stuff in spring, but give yourself the chance to not drown first, which again, didn't do an undergrad. (laughs) So great advice. Great advice out there. You hear that? Um, Alrighty, Anna. Yes. So can you share a little bit about, um, you know, the important work that you do with Morgan's message Uh, for those out there who aren't familiar with Morgan's message? Uh, the organization, what you're doing, and just um, what you hope um, yes. people learn about it. Absolutely. So I can just kind of give a brief explanation of um, what Morgan's message is, why it was founded, and just some of the important people that I've experienced and um, gotten to know along the way. So uh, Morgan's message was founded after a loss of a teammate and a friend um, to suicide named Morgan Rogers, and she was on the Duke women's lacrosse team here, and she was on the Duke club lacrosse team, and she was a person, a friend, uh, a confidant, an ally, um, just an amazing person all around, just one of those people that really like lights up a room when um, she walked into it. And I think something that was extremely important for her parents and close friends to do was take this um, tragedy and, and make something good out of it, find the silver lining. And uh, her, her parents and friends are incredible people, and her, her family, her twin and her brother are just incredible people. And they started this uh, mental health non-for-profit called Morgan's Message. And I started an ambassador program here on campus with Dr. Sean Zeppelin, and it was just literally called um, uh, Mental Health Advocates for Athletes. And that was right when COVID hit. And when I was on my way back to school, right after COVID, I had actually stopped um, at Morgan's house and um, saw uh, Miss Donna and Mr. Kurt, her parents, and you know, just was one checking in on them, catching up with them, um, and then brought this idea to them of, I have this um, program here at Duke, I wanna name it after Morgan, I wanna do something in honor of her, um, considering the impact that she had on me and the people around her. And um, in doing that, we kind of collectively had this idea to start an ambassador program for Morgan's message. So Duke was the first ambassador program, and now there's, um, uh, 820 ambassador programs and almost 2,000 ambassadors um, across the nation. Um, that's in on universities and high school campuses. And I think there's almost like 40,000 followers on Instagram. We have a podcast called uh-huh. The Mental Matchup, which is um, really headed by Katzen Pollock, who was a Duke lacrosse graduate and um, a very close friend of Morgan who helped co-found uh, Morgan's message as a whole. So. Um, I really was there for just the ambassador program, but really what kickstarted it was that uh, non for profit that non for profit aspect, which has really led the charge from or for some systemic change about mm-hmm. mental health and and all those things. And um, I just think kind of the importance of it is yes, it's it's there for athletes, but also just destigmatizing mental health um, as a whole. I just think it's something that's so valuable and so important to human beings, especially after COVID. Uh, the impact that it had on people. So um, it's just been really amazing. I'm here, I'm the president on campus with um, Stephanie Zimpalik, who is uh, also a women's lacrosse player here. She's a senior, Um, she's a history major. Uh, She's amazing, one of my closest friends and is also Kat's sister. Um, And then Carrie Neese, who is a sophomore here at Duke. Um, She's also on the team and she is like a treasurer um, type person and we're gonna hand it over to her once Stephanie and I graduate. So we're very fortunate to have such a great support system um, in all the coaches at Duke, all of the uh, student athletes, all the administrative staff around Duke has just been so great um, for helping us get this kick started. And it's really led to a lot of change on Duke campus. Um, we got this endowment from a couple families for 
just uh, Duke Athletics Behavioral Health after Morgan's message has started. Um, just a lot of amazing things that have, have been changed um, because of the student athletes, the administrators, the coaches, and everyone on Duke campus. So, yeah, tell, tell, tell them about the one you were talking about where you could have a day off. You could. Um, oh yeah. So actually, um, it, it's this is on Duke campus as well. Um, there are a lot more programs and um, different like professional sports leagues that are allowing people to, you know, when you get the injury report and you know you see people like okay running back out hamstring injury or something like that, um, you're now allowed to put um, mental well-being on that as a um, chance to kind of take a step back. And I know our coaches and the coaches on Duke Athletic Campus allow student athletes to take days for mental well-being um, if, if they see fit. So I think some of those things have been great changes for um, all of us on a lot of levels. But as uh, just individuals as a whole, it's just really important um, for us to start this conversation. Right, yeah, and we were talking beforehand that, you know, the, with the more and more news and press around athletes, professional athletes, Olympic athletes, prioritizing their mental mm-hmm. health, mental health mm-hmm. I think also helps, right? With yeah. Files and others yes. who really are saying, you know what, I'm going to yeah. take care of myself. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of, um, you know, college football players and basketball players and just, you know, ev- a lot of these athletes that actually are coming out, taking a step back from their sport um, to work on their mental health. And I think um, there's a lot of awesome, famous athletes out there. I know Kevin Love mm-hmm. has the Kevin Love Foundation. Um, Victoria Garrick, the hidden opponent, who um, is just amazing, especially for body image. And mm-hmm. a lot of people really struggle with that, going back to imposter syndrome once they graduate from, you know, college and athletics. Like, what is my identity outside of sport? Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's Morgan's mess. One of Morgan's message, I feel like biggest um, biggest conversations is like, what do we do after this? What's our identity? And and being able to be a part of that has been really amazing for me. Right. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about your typical day as a um, master's in management studies student? Because I think people kind of understand yeah. what it's like to be an MBA student, but share a little bit about what yeah. is it like to be in the MMS. Um, So for me as an athlete, uh, it might be a little bit different than like the uh, typical student here. But um, so in the morning I wake up, I have 8 a.m. practice and that goes from typically about 8 to 11. Um, And then I, you know, go home, make myself breakfast or lunch and, you know, just get myself settled, um, get ready for class. And then I normally head here to Fuqua to get some work done, uh, meet with some teammates, just kind of go over some important things for class uh, to really just prioritize that time management. And then my classes, because I'm in uh, Section C, go from 1.45 to 4, and then 4.15 to 6.30. So kind of here for class during those periods. And then on some days, it just goes from 1.45 to 4. So after that happens, I typically will either go get extra work in um, for lacrosse, or I'll go home and you know continue to do some schoolwork. And once I finish that, it's normally around 8.30. Um, and then I can go hang out with friends. Um, maybe go get dinner, you know, watch football game, something like that. Um, and then typically, you know, get to bed around 10, 30 or 11 and wake up and, and do it again. But it's a very fulfilling experience um, and it's, it's really amazing. What does that feel like to get to bed? before midnight it's really great it's, and here's here's the thing it's something that I've had to work on ever since my freshman year because my time management was poor I will say it very poor um, and that's not all too obviously um, but it's really nice and you know obviously um, performing uh, athletics at a higher level you really need to prioritize your body and getting three meals in a day you know getting all this stuff in with your team team bonding all that stuff. It's similar to like, you know, someone being in a club. It's it's a lot of hard work and effort that goes into being present in all of your activities. So I think mm-hmm. just mindfulness, having, you know, presence allows me to kind of time manage in that way to, gosh, you to get to sleep before before midnight. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, what would you like to accomplish before you graduate, Ian? Anything in particular? Um, Maybe that you haven't already experienced. <laughs> well, I think I would like to... I don't know if there's any like particular like thing I'd mm-hmm. like to accomplish, but there's a few things that I'm craving. Um, firstly, I'd like to um, meet people that I didn't have the opportunity to meet before. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very, very, very aware of what a wonderfully global school Fuqua is, and I'm incredibly happy to be here, and so I'd like to broaden out 
my my friends on a global scale and know people going forward and mm-hmm. all sorts of different places. Um, I would like to um, tell people that they're like I, I want to be involved, I guess, in small ways, telling people that they're they're good enough to do it. Like mm-hmm. specifically within like the consulting kind of roadmap. I think it's like ripe with people to just like think that they're not good enough to do it. I, I wrote a note in my phone the other day. Like, I, this is actually a good answer to your question. I, next year, when there's like new first years, I just want to like tell all the first years, like, you guys are going to be fine. That's what I want to do. I want to tell everybody you're going to be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think three, to kind of be very blunt, like, I, I would like to exit here um, in a better place than I entered here mm-hmm. mentally, physically, right. professionally, um, personally. Mm-hmm. And I think. Mm-hmm. Everything should kind of be in service to that. Right. Um, yeah. Let's go. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. I like that. Um, Stephanie, uh, two questions. What would you want the audience out here to know about? You know what we provide in terms of resources and tools, or just things to keep in mind as a potential student and the support that they'll receive. And then the second question. And you guys are all. No, no one's going <laughs> to get away with this. But what's your self care practice? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, so. We, we offer a lot of resources internally at Fuqua. I think one of the best things we do have, um, it's, it's kind of focusing on the student, um, it's probably daytime students, but it is uh, our connections with all students is important as well. But we definitely connect with uh, the uh, counseling and psychological services. When I say we, I'm connecting with you now. <laughs> <laughs> so I will be connecting with you. Yes, but yes. Our Office of Student Life, so Madeline Dreyer is, um, is a person that a lot of our students end up going to. And I think what I would like to bring to the students, um, so the Office of the Community Engagement and Inclusion, um, we want to be able to create, continue to create spaces for students to know that they can come and be their authentic selves. And, and I know that sounds like a um, buzz phrase. Can I say buzz phrase? <laughs> um, I'm going to. So it's, to be your authentic self, it really does make a huge difference. Um, if I just say personally myself, um, when I came out, which is this interesting, now even saying that seems like it's too much because this is who I am and I tell you now. But in the beginning when I did, um, it, it lifts just so much weight off of you. So you don't have to pretend that certain parts of your life uh, didn't happen the way they did because you can now be open and honest about it. That has just been an amazing experience. And I want other mm-hmm. students to have that as well. So being able to create those spaces for students. Um, and we do have, a, a, you know, the mental health first aid piece, which is a bit more structured. So if you want to be trained, you know, you don't have to come here <laughs> to be trained in this. You can, you can go online and get trained as well. Yeah. But it's a, it's a, it's a plus <laughs> of uh, yes. being a Fuqua student. So, um, so I, 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 I jog. I, I try. Like, let's be honest. It's like 12, <laughs> it's like 12 minute miles. And it has to be outside. I tried doing the... <laughs> I tried doing the treadmill this morning. It was horrific. I was I got to two point five miles. And I was just like I just I don't want to anymore. What? So, okay, two point five is a lot. Okay, it's a lot. I don't well, even know if I, I can mean, do that. Yeah. Well, when I went outside though, so I run like four to five times a week, and outside hopefully, and it's like between four or five miles. So two point five is just like I feel like a failure. It's amazing. <laughs> yes, my gosh. Yes. Because I trot though. Once again. Yeah. I trot. Okay. Um, and the beach is just my. Mm. It's where I can feel centered. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. I went last week and I was just like, okay, I'm gonna watch Great. the waves and I feel a bit better. So, mm-hmm. What about you, Ty? So any parting upcoming cool. events, things that you would want folks to know about? Um, um, and then what's your self-care practice? Whew, that second one though. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for the first, things to share. So the first piece is that, right? Like I am the Fugue Liaison. Um, so, so folks can get to know me faculty and staff can get to know me here. Like that, that is one of the first main things we have. Um, and Fuqua is not the only one with the liaison. That is part of our, the project that I affectionately call the CAPS Rebuild. Uh, what students said that they needed, and that's one of the ways we responded. And so we have liaisons for the different schools. We have one for, uh, we have liaisons for the RCs and housing and residence life, as well as the identity centers. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, when crises come up, if programming, just because those are the groups where, where you need that mental health messaging, how to target it, we're doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, as a reminder, just in case you did not know, 
well, it's not happening right now, but starting in the spring, CAPS does have extended hours, and so graduate students needed more time to come in. Mm -hmm. So on Tuesdays, we have extended our hours for walk-ins um, between the hours of 9 and 6. So what this means, and we do walk-ins every day, well, Monday through Friday, 9 to 4, on every other day of the week. What that means is when you come in, Please set aside about 30 to 45 minutes uh, so you can do some paperwork, and then you'll meet with a counselor. That counselor will then have a conversation with you about what's happening. Uh, you all can build a plan for your mental wellness. You know, is it our resources that you want? Would you like to be referred out to the community? We can do all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, so you have that uh, accessible to you. Um, in the spring, we do have a new set of groups coming up. I don't have all of that information okay. right now, but I will be actually doing a group for black women, uh, which Great. will be on cool. Tuesday nights. So, Good. yeah, Good. I'm excited about that. Now, self-care, who? So this is actually my favorite time of the year. I know. <laughs> I love Hallmark. I love to make cookies. <laughs> so <Yes. laughs> That's That's so, so <laughs> this this time of year, I can I can say, after a long day, um, one of the things I look forward to is a binging in front of a Hallmark movie <laughs> because it's so predictable. Yes. You just know, like I, I, I need that after a yes. day. Yes. I love the predictability, um, but also trying out different cookie recipes. Um, <laughs> yeah. My latest thing is going to be a chocolate snickerdoodle um, with a good. Mexican uh, chocolate and cream cheese icing. Oh, I'm going to try that out. But that it's just that grounds me. That centers me. That helps bring me to I am just more than this person on this yeah. campus. There are things that I want to do. Mm. And I have my fur babies, too. So. Oh, yes. I cuddle. Yeah, I fur babies. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. cookie sounds uh, really good. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Ian and then Anna, self-care practice? Um, it was different before Duke. I grew, up, I grew up in Santa Cruz, California, so I surf every day and get in the water and do that. But um, here it's been a lot of trying to slow down because it's really fast here. So go on a run, go to the gym, and then like sit, <laughs> like mm -hmm. like literally just sit down. Um, so it's been a lot of like physical exercise. And then, um, yeah, I just got a Kindle. So I've been using that a lot to yeah. cool down. Yeah. How about you, Anna? Well, I just have a suggestion. I don't know if you've heard of the Washington Duke Trail. It's like, yeah. okay, good. Yeah, because yeah. that is like the best trail to run. I think it's like Ooh, three I mile guess. loop. Yeah. <laughs> It's very up and down, very hilly if you want to go challenge. I am not an athlete. But like, I'm not a college athlete. So I'm gonna go love it. You seem like an athletic type, someone who loves to exercise. It's really fun. People are like always walking their dogs. <laughs> we actually, try it out. We actually no did plan. this thing with uh, with our team where we like literally carried our teammates on stretchers through that trail so to like work on like team cohesion. Like oh, it was God. crazy. It was unreal. But like I will never forget it. It was really I'm hard, sure you will not. I'm very acquainted with the trail now. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. Anna. Yeah, so please, yeah, if you ever want to do that. But um, yeah, for me, um, my self-care, I seek um, my outlet a lot in lacrosse. So for me, I was injured over the summer. I got surgery, and it was really hard not to have that. But So I was able to kind of, you know, find a couple more things that I like to do. I love to cook. Um, I really like cooking. Me and my, like, girlfriend will often, like, cook at night, um, and that's a really good way for me to wind down. I love the show like White Lotus, um, oh, which is a really great, yeah. so good. Okay. The finale just came out. <laughs> Won't give any spoilers, but really good. Um, and then I just love um, to just hang out with my friends. I think um, I know you mentioned this earlier, but just like having a good group of people to just mm -hmm. like wind down with and just kind of like you know talk about anything with is something that's really helpful for me and. Um, a final thing that I like to do is I like to like make flower bouquets and stuff, mm -hmm. which is like kind of interesting. But I have like a whole thing on my phone. Whole Foods, I'll just go there and me and um, my florist tree work a lot together on you know getting these things for my friends and my family and all that. So I enjoy that a lot. So but yeah. Yeah. yeah, for me it's spinning. I'm a, Ooh, I love spinning yeah. classes, wow. bar classes, and nice. also my little fur baby too, Aww. lovey. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, this has been so wonderful to get to know you and to hear your stories and to share all the wisdom and um, with the audience, with each of us, each of you. Uh, it's just a real gift. And so I want to thank each of you, and I hope, I wish you both the best in the rest of your time here at Pucola. I thank each of you for the support um, and the pouring in of our students that you provide. And then I want to thank our audience uh, 
for sharing this time with us. You know, it's a very important topic. Please continue to have the conversations. Continue to seek out mental health well-being resources. Uh, we have, you, you've learned how many we have here at Pugwa, and so uh, no matter where you are, continue to prioritize your own mental health well-being. I wish each and every one of you and your loved ones a safe holiday wherever you are. Um, look out for new series in our Blue Table Talks in the spring in 2023. But until then, please take care of each other and take care of yourselves, and thank you so much.